Chapter 10, Dance with the Devil! You arrive at the office early the next morning and are relieved to find Aislinn and Gigi standing over the office coffee pot. You two? Gabe's office now. Fine, but only because ordering people around looks really good on you. Can you wait three minutes for me to drink my consciousness potion? Nope, bring the coffee. You can wake up on the way. Gigi and Aisling exchange a surprised look and hurry after you. Gabe glances up as you charge into his office. One look at your face stops whatever glib comment he had brewing. What's going on? Sadie called me last night. She needs our help. She wants our help. After the hell she put you through? Wow. I'm saying I agree with it, but you have to admit, that's a baller move. Gabe sits back, his eyes thoughtful. Did she say what she needed our help with? Hmm. She said she'd make it worth our while. What does that mean exactly? Money? Connections? Opportunities? When it comes to Sadie, I'd guess all the above. Whatever she's offering, we don't need it. Don't be so quick to write her off, Aislinn. Sadie could take her business to any firm in the city and would be treated like royalty, but she chose us. Whatever it is, it's important to her. So we're going to help her? We have to at least consider it. Sadie might be an evil corporate shill, but her name still carries a lot of weight. But... Trust me, I still haven't forgot what she did, and I'm sure as a hell haven't forgiven her. But we can use this to the firm's advantage. Well, she does owe us emotional damages. Emotional damage! <laughs> well, considering who she knows in town and upstate, she'd be able to pay them off in uh, full through client recommendations. Excellent size. I guess talking to her couldn't hurt, but if you want this Quinn, then I'm on board. She'll be at her cabin at this time of year. I'll uh, head on up this afternoon. See what's... A uh, game? Sadie called me. Uh, I don't want to be forceful, but I'm going to do it for once. I can't probably... Uh, I don't abruptly take over your cases that you bring in, do I? I've known Sadie a lot longer than you have, Quinn. Then why didn't she call you, dum-dum? And if it mattered to her, she would have called you. He looks away, stung. You step forward, leaning your palms on the edge of his desk. You run a firm now. Please stop treating me like a child and let me do what you pay me to do. He looks out the window for a long moment and sighs. <sighs> You're right, Quinn. This case, whatever it is, is all yours. Just promise me you'll reach out if you need help. Don't worry, game. I'll reach out if I need you. Telling Sadie this case will be involving some kind of a curveball. The Brain Trust will be waiting for you when she does. I'm on standby. Do you bring your personal media guru in case she implicates you in any newsworthy scandals? Thank you for that. Go on then. Show Sadie why she was right to pull you out of the podunk nowhere. He returns to his paperwork, slightly dismissing you. You hesitate. Mmm. Walk out with Aislinn or stay with him. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna walk out with Aislinn. You follow Aislinn out of Gabe's office. That got kind of intense. Sadie always n was controversial, even before she was an accessory to murder. Not a sentence you hear too often. Hey, guess me for good, lu good luck? Not sure that's gonna help you much with Sadie, but I won't argue with it. You grin and bring her lips to yours, gently kissing her. You should be called away, uh, to vaguely unnerving assignments more often. Or we could just guess more. Good point. 
way better option. Just don't forget to look the part. If Sadie has a blind spot, it's the one caused by a killer outfit. If you show up looking uh, every inch the high-powered lawyer, I have a feeling she'll have a tougher time steamrolling you. You stop by your office, grab a few things, and you give yourself a quick once-over. Mason's right. If I want to have a leg up on Sadie, I should change into something that will impress her. Ugh. I have but one question. How would this impress anyone? I'm just asking. After a quick change, you relax in the back of the firm's car and watch the bustle of the city give way to greener countryside of the upstate New York. You feel strangely wistful as Sadie's cabin finally comes into view. A lot's happened since the last time I was here. Back then, I thought Sadie was the epitome of a lawyer I hoped to become someday. Now, you take a deep breath and climb out of the car, forcing yourself to relax as you walk up the drive and rap on the door. Sadie answers after a long few moments. She looks as put together as always, her sharp eyes assessing you in one efficient sweep. Just for battle, good. You learned a few things from me after all. That is why I came to New York, at least initially. She smiles dryly and opens the door wider, inviting you inside. I should thank you for agreeing to meet me. I know it must not have been an easy decision for you. It wasn't easy. But it couldn't have been easy for you either. A look of astonishment cracks through her careful facade. I didn't... I didn't expect... Oh, yeah, yeah, I do that to people. I make them, you know, go, what? She swallows hard, eyes glistening slightly. No, it wasn't easy reaching out to the man who single-handedly brought my career crashing down around me. Hmm. This case must be very important to you, then. Will you tell me about it? <clears throat> she nods and invites you to take a seat. One of my neighbors here recently had a major renovation on his home. You can see it if you look out across the lake. Mm. And what, you don't like the view? Oh, it's beautiful work, but Jeff refuses to pay the contractor for it. The contractor he used had a modify the initial plan once I started work. They couldn't add a two-story deck Jeff wanted on the back. Okay, what was his reason for changing the project plan? There were structural issues. The land simply wouldn't have supported what Jeff wanted. And the contractor, a local named Dennis Garcia, told him... I'm assuming Dennis removed the deck from uh, the renovation budgets. Of course! And he explained why he couldn't do it safely, how it might damage the entire house or hurt someone. But Jeff used to getting what he wants, full stop. Now he's going to bankrupt a good man because of a temper tantrum. The outstanding bill amounts to almost a million dollars. And that's not taking into account all the work Dennis has lost. Jeff owns a major television network. The money is pocket change to him, but it'll absolutely ruin Dennis. So you called me out here to take down a media mogul and help Dennis get paid? <clears throat> yes. But I just don't... I don't just want you to get the money. I want you to take this uh, to court so there's public record that Dennis was in the right. Jeff is always smearing Dennis to everyone he knows in town, and it costs Dennis professionally and personally. So, this is a selfless act. I'm not buying it. Believe it or not, Quinn, I am more than the woman who helped Peter Koenig cover up a murder. Oh, I know. And before that, you were among the most ambitious lawyers in one of the toughest cities in the world. Ambition doesn't make me a monster. I built McGraw Burn from the ground up, remember? The firm's exemplary pro bono history is my legacy. I've always looked out for the little guy. Her body language is a little too defensive. You've hit a nerve. I know I have. So, there's nothing in this case for you other than helping out a valued member of your community. She huffs. Fine! Just positioning the town council to, for access to the private woods bordering my property. If you take him to court for screwing over a local, they'll have to side with me against granting him that access. Ah, oh, and there it is. 
Mm, not so selfless after all. I... I mean, okay. She does have a reasonable claim, right? The guy is being an a-hole. But, uh, it is a petty squabble. But, it is in the wrong, because what happened to Dennis. I'm just gonna go with I knew it. It's all about the quid pro quo with you. And what's wrong with that? Me having a skin in the game doesn't change the fact that Jeff is a thief and Dennis needs your help. Mm, I didn't say it was wrong. I just said it was predictable. Luckily for me, not many people would agree with you. She sits back crossing her legs. So, will you help me stop a television mogul from driving an innocent man to destitution or not? Yes, I'll help. But I'm not doing it for you. And yet the outcome is the same, no matter how much you feel like moralizing over it. You take your laptop out of your bag and flick her uh, flat look. Just call Dennis, Sadie. No need. A polite tapping comes from the front door. You told him I'd take your case before you even spoke to me. You were hardly going to come all this way out just to turn me down, were you? She shows the man inside. He greets you with a strong, enthusiastic handshake. Ah, oh, nice to meet you, Mr. Michaels. Sadie here has told me a lot of great things about you. Likewise. How do you and Sadie know each other? Uh, she hired me to do her renovations when she first moved in. These days, she throws me a bone. She needs uh, something done. Ah, a bone. I wouldn't exactly call rebuilding my library from scratch a bone. Maybe a T-bone. Dennis screams at her. Their easy rapport surprises you. Let's just talk about the job you did for Sadie's neighbor. What was the exact issue with uh, what he wanted you to do? The deck he wanted was too large for the house. The land couldn't support it. This side of lake is boggier than this one. It wouldn't happen right away, but eventually you're looking at foundational shifts, possibly structural, major structural damage. How major are we talking? Absolute best case scenario? He'll have cracks in his walls within a year. Worst case, half his house falls into the lake. Even if I could get it to pass code now, I can't in good conscience do work like that, which is exactly what I told him. Hmm, I see. Do you have a contract in place? Not a detailed one. I quoted him the cost of renovations he wanted, which he agreed to, and we signed on. And when you realized you couldn't complete the deck as planned? I pulled it off the quotes, and in the updated version, I even itemized all the costs we'd set aside for materials and labor. And did he sign that version? He did. But then he claimed that uh, I wasn't clear about the scope of the work I'd failed to complete, so it doesn't count. It doesn't matter, he still signed it. He's trying to bully you. The signed contract definitely helps us. Uh, what did he do when you made it clear you wouldn't build the deck? Called me some unpleasant names. Told me to get off his property. I did as he asked and invoiced him the next day. And he didn't pay. He refused. He said I didn't finish the work so I don't get paid. Which was bad enough, but the, then my next job canceled on me. And then the next, and that's when I realized he'd been spreading lies about me all over town. About my subpar work and poor work ethic. Reputations, everything up here. I haven't had a job since. Hmm. If reputations, everything... How much uh, longer can your business stay afloat? A few more weeks, uh, thanks to PD job, uh, Sadie threw me with her gazebo. I suppose I could always have a conservatory built. You can't keep my business afloat on your own, Sadie. I've got kids, a mortgage, Mr. Michaels. If you can't help me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can help you, Dennis. I'm sure of it. Sadie turns an interested eye on you as you think of her, uh, how you want to handle this case. Well, <laughs> finish the work Jeff wants done. No, because it would be worse. Um, sue Jeff and subpoena his business dealings for the last ten years. Yeah, no, I agree with that. That's the professional way to do it. More cutthroat. What will that do? Make his life a living hill, for one thing. 
we'll get your money, and then some. If this is how Jeff plays ball, I guarantee his television network has an army of skeletons in his closet. By the time I'm done putting Jeff's reputation through the shredder, nobody is in a hundred miles will question yours. Danix lets out a long, unsteady breath. Ah, <sighs> when Sadie knew she, or said she knew somebody who could help, I, I had my doubts, but she was right. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Eh, Sadie's picking up your legal fees, so all you owe me is your phone number. He happily hands you his card. You exchange it for your own. I'll be in touch uh, for further details. In the meantime, send me any and all paperwork you have with Jeff. I want invoices, emails, everything. You got it. I look forward to speaking with you again. Sadie sees him to the door and then turns back to regard you with a smile. Very nicely done, Queen. Listen, I didn't ask for your, like, approval. Shut up. Just doing my job. I expect no less. Now, grab a coat. Where are we going? Dinner. Do you feel like going all the way back to the city on an empty stomach? I don't even get a choice in the matter. Follow Sadie past the 40 minute waiting line in an intimately lit restaurant with a beautiful view of the darkening forest. As you take your seats, the maitre d' approaches eagerly and pours two glasses of champagne. Miss McGraw, I see you found yourself a rather striking dinner guest. Menu? You can let the chef choose for us, Victoria. Ren has never disappointed me. Very good. Raise an eyebrow, Sadie exchanges pleasantries with the diners at other tables, many of whom you recognize from the Fortune 500 list. Good to see you too, Edwina. If my meeting doesn't run uh, long, we'll chat then. You lean close to Sadie. Doesn't she own half of Broadway? She does. The Hamptons set things. It has uh, the monopoly on old money. But that's just because their upstarts haven't heard of this place. The next few minutes bring a microcosm of New York's elite. A major property developer, hedge fund manager, a well-known entrepreneur. It's clear they still consider Sadie to be one of them. Well, of course. And she's got plenty of connections, and they've got plenty of connections. These people seem to respect you. Just how good was your deal with McGraw Burn? Good enough that I'm not willing to jeopardize it by discussing it, especially in a restaurant of all places. You and Sadie are alone now in the soft glow of candlelight. Her eyes linger on yours as she takes a sip of her champagne. I swear to God, if there's a bounce chicken wow wow option, no, just say no. When I scouted you for McGraw Burn last year, I expected you to do well. I even expected you to do be something of a trailblazer. But I'll admit I never expected you to be a catalyst. A catalyst for what? Trouble? Change. I know Gabe better than he knows himself months ago. I have wagered good money on him staying with McGraw Burn to the better end. But one resignation later from you, and he's laying his savings in the line to start his own firm. That's nice of you to say, but... He was already considered leaving. You mean the weeks he spent sulking because the firm found a new golden boy? He'd have gotten over that eventually. You shake your head, frustrated by how or obtuse she's being. Gabe didn't start a new firm on the fly because of me, Sadie. He did it because of you. I beg your pardon. You meant everything to Gabe. Learning who you really were could have broken him. But it lit a fire under him instead. When he realized he wasn't enough to stop Eli and Martin from turning McGraw Burn into a firm that pandered only to the powerful. He did the only thing he could. He built a firm he could be proud of. Sadie takes a deep breath. It's hard to read the emotions playing out behind her eyes, but you swear you see a flare of fierce pride. He has plenty to be proud of. Despite all the odds, you're a firm to be reckoned with. You've been keeping an eye on us, I assume? Any new firm posing an incredible threat to McGraw Byrne would have my attention. I just happen to have a special interest in this one. There's a glimmer in her eye that tells you that she's not just speaking about Gabe. So, does Gabe have you working on any interesting cases in this good fight of his? The waiter arrives with two small, artful dishes of seared scallops. You study her as you uh, take a bite. She might have some pertinent advice on how to deal with the conservator case, but you're not sure if you can trust her. What are we working on? 
I don't think she's gonna side with Martin and Eli. I'm gonna be honest with you. She's not, like... Mmm, no. No, she's already in a good deal enough with McGrawburn as it is. You know. Ah, yes, her grandmother. You already know. I still have a few friends at McGrawburn. Are they were blocking your attempts to pursue the case? And then some. They've been keeping us from even deposing the orderlies involved with Aislinn's grandmother's care. That must be frustrating for you. Hmm, it's not about how I feel. Aislinn's grandmother is just the tip of the iceberg. We found evidence that this has been happening to at least a dozen other individuals in the last year alone. Or Aislinn. She hasn't been able to see her grandmother since she was forced into care. I mean, technically, that's not true. Sadie purses her lips thoughtfully. These orderlies, they don't happen to all to work at Bell Bureau General, do they? Um, how did you know that? Oh my god, this is like, it's like a record with it, it just keeps repeating, right? Eli Byrne is on the board there. There's no love lost between Eli and Gabe, but he wouldn't have the case just out of spite. So he's protecting the hospital. Or the hospital's paying the orderlies legal fees, but... That's aside the point. Eli has made his way at Bell Bureau, and by the extension the homes they partner with, he wouldn't be able to reverse the conservatorship. But he could get Aislinn on the approved visitor list at her grandmother's care facility. You'd do that? After what you did for me today, I'm happy to give you the small favor. Take Sadie's offer of help and get Aislinn unlimited access. Ugh. Deal with the devil. Seriously, it's a deal with the devil, let's be honest. Sadie sets her phone in the center of the table and dials Eli, hitting the speaker button. He answers promptly. Bigger troubles already? Hardly. I need you to do something for me. Name it. If it's easy, I'll do it for free. I need you to pull some strings at Bell Bureau, get Ace Lynn Tanaka or visiting rights for a grandmother at... She looks at you questioningly. Green Gardens, nursing him. Who's that? I'm sitting with Gwyn Michaels, your own speaker for the record. Hi, Eli. Has there been a chemical leak upstate? Why on earth are you with the man who ran you out of town? There's nothing good on TV up here, so will you do it? I would help Michaels and Tanaka after the public vendetta they're holding against my firm. Your firm? Because this is about Aislinn's family, not some petty grudge. She hasn't been able to see her grandmother in months due to the conservatorship that is, uh, should never have happened. Martin refused to let Aislinn bring the case to McGraw Byrne. In case you're wondering why she felt she had to leave you. That's unfortunate. But this isn't a small request, and I don't see why I should risk my reputation for a former associate. Eli, if you do this, consider my memory of what happened at Cabo Wived. You haven't told Michaels about Cabana, have you? I haven't yet. Is a pregnant silence. <laughs> a pregnant silence? What? What's Tanoka's grandmother's name? Sorcha. Flannery. Fine. She'll be on the visiting list by tomorrow and Sunny. Yes, Eli. Consider this the last favor I do for you, we'll even know. Hmm, we'll see. Good night, Eli. She ends the call and you frown at her, confused. I wouldn't call cashing in your last year with Eli Burn a small favor. Why did you do that? I owed you. What? Four. Take your pick. She raises her glass, watching over the rim. Think about... Think what you like about me, Quinn. But I always pay my debts. The maitre d' at your table appears at it. Sets what only can be described as two plates of art in front of you and Sadie. Rich people. Local venison stuff, stuffed with chestnuts, slow-cooked for 12 hours, and served with potato and candied plums. Smells divine. Till Randy's outdone himself. I'll pass on your compliments. Bon appetit. 
You cut in your venison, the meat parting beneath your blade without any effort. The smell that unfurls beneath your nose is rich with spices. Holy. Mm, thought you might like this place. You eat in surprisingly comfortable silence. Eddie's gaze flicks behind you as you use your last sliver of venison to sop up the sauce. She leans in a lower voice. Don't look, Bernard Cumbias is headed our way. Venture capitalist, three pugs, all treated better than the were than the most first world children. Sadie McGraw, I was hoping fate would place us in Hamlet Grove at the same time. You look up to see a man with a content pug tucked under his uh, one arm. The man glances you too appraisingly impressed by uh, with what he sees. Oh, I wouldn't want to interrupt your meeting with this ex exquisite young professional. Nonsense, Bernard. You're always welcome. This is Quinn Michaels, a former associate of mine. Quinn, this is Bernard Combes. And this cutie is... Uh, Francosis, is it? You remember. Nice to meet you, Mr. Combes. Would it be okay if I fetch your pug? Oh, of course. He loves to make new friends, don't you, my sweet boy? He bristles with pleasure as you scratch between his ears. Ah, oh, this is a friendly little guy. You are. Yes, you are. Listen. Stop it with pugs. They're not that goddamn cute. The poor bastard suffers so much with, like, horrible breathing issues and everything else. They're an atrocity of the dog world. Let's be honest. <laughs> Listen, you know I'm true. Oh, he likes you. Sadie gives you an approving smile behind her champagne. I take it you work at my grow, burn them. Quinn actually followed my old prodigy to his new firm. You mean Gabe Ritchie. I always liked him. And more importantly, so does Princess Wrinkles Fluffybottom, my eldest. In fact, I've been thinking about lately that I should set up a trust with my, uh, for my little angels. A trust fund for your pugs. It's a very good idea. <clears throat> it's the only way to ensure they'll be taken care of financially should anything happen to you, even though the pugs will most likely die before you die. But, you know, moving on. <laughs> shh, shh, shh. Don't ruin this for this man. That's exactly what I'm worried about. I have a will, of course, with provisions for my babies, but... Wills can be contested, a trust for your dogs, uh, with an allowance for their chosen caretaker would be faster for, or safer for them, and it would certainly give you greater peace of mind. Well, that settles it. Do you have a card? Yes. Francis sniffs at your business card as you hand it over, his little curly tail wheeling from side to side. Oh, we'll be in touch first thing Monday. I'll make sure it's a video call so that I can meet all of your precious pugs. Mmm. Sadie leans forward as Bernard takes his leave. Her leg brushes yours beneath the table. It's been such a pleasure watching you work today, Gwen. I always knew you were good, but... I thought a woman, when she brushed her leg up against yours under a table, was flirting with you. Did that change? Well... Let's just say I find myself more intrigued by you than I expected. Her leg brushes yours again. This time she lingers, letting it her shapely calf trail against yours. Are you hitting on me? I was right! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he asked the obvious question! Why so surprised? I don't know, you're like twice my age. I mean, there's nothing really wrong with that, but also the awkward situation we've been in the past, like all this other shit. It's weird. It's really weird. Because I nearly outed you as an accomplice for murder less than six months ago. Anger is a powerful aphrodisiac. Strife like ours only ends one way. The one's hands around the other's throat. Don't tell me you wouldn't enjoy that. What, my hands around your throat or you're around mine? I don't know which one. Or maybe both, I don't know. Her fingertips find your wrist, and she runs a nail lightly over uh, the inside. 
You think I can't see the contempt oozing off of you? How desperate you are to lash out at me? This is your one chance to do it. Don't... <laughs> shit is wild man this shit is a wild so not a bad outfit um if you know this was allowable on youtube i would just go for it just to see what would happen right um but there's no purpose i'm gonna i'm gonna be honest with you guys uh, i'm not interested sorry you like gg i'm waiting for bow to call it and be like yo man let's go she leans back her legs leaving yours let's see sadie It's not that I don't find you attractive, it's just that I'm not interested in you and that way. She chuckles. Don't worry, Quinn, you haven't hurt my feelings. She signals to the Mater D. You should call for your car. I'll settle things here. Thank you for your hard work today. Tell Dennis I'll be in touch. You push your chair back and head for the door of the restaurant. As you glance back, you see Sandy sitting alone in the candlelight still. Formidable, but diminished. Somehow. SOMEHOW! Literally, she just tried to sleep with you! How is that literally not somehow? That is desperate! I said it! That's how I see it, I don't know. It's intriguing, but no thank you. Ixon steps into your office, stays after you visit with Sadie, armed with two mugs of coffee. She sets one in front of you. Also, there is only one woman in my life in this book. It's Aislinn. I, I, you know, normally I'm more open. Eh. So, how was your journey into the Dragon's Lair? Listen, she tried to seduce me. It was horrible. It was surprising. Sadie wanted me to stop a predatory TV a moogle from bankrupting a hard-working local contractor. No, 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 keep going. That's nice of her. She didn't exactly have selfless reasons for doing it, but well, still, it did make me reconsider her at least a little. I've been thinking of her all oh, oh, as this villain, but now I can't figure her out. Maybe I don't need to. A uh, good thing happened regardless of her motivations. You helped someone who needed it. Two good things happen. Apparently, their uh, local paper just did a piece on the settlement we secured for Dennis. Oh. So we don't do actual legal work anymore. We just sleep with people now. All right, got it. Local contractor secures huge settlement. New York law firm Reaching Associates has helped Dennis Garcia recoup over one million in unpaid fees. Better than Opus Mag, I'll tell you. That's great press for us, considering how many major players have property up there. I think Gabe will be very happy with it. But that's uh, not all the good that came out of my trip. What? You scored another new client on top of a contractor? Uh, yeah, actually. I scored us a venture capitalist with an army of pugs. Pugs? Seriously? Mmm, but that's not what I was going to tell you. Sadie made a call and got you on Sorge's approved visitor list at Green Gardens. She stares at you completely dumbfounded. She... what? Oh, and I didn't even have to sleep with her for it. You can visit Sorge as often as you... The breath goes out of you as she rounds your desk, wraps her arms around you, and squeezes tightly. Thank you, Quinn. Let's go right now. Whoa, 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 we're in the workplace. You want me to come? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I can't make this shit up. I just go with it. Of course. Nan already loves you. Whoa. <laughs> How can I say no to that? An hour later, you check in at Green Gardens. A warm feeling spreads through you as Aislinn and her grandma cling to each other, tears shining in their eyes. Oh, Tex, all well and good, but it does my heart good to see you in the flesh again, my girl. And this time I can stay as long as I want. Whenever I want. A privilege I fully intend to abuse. I have it no other way. The old woman looks at you shyly, or slyly. It seems you're something of a miracle worker, young man. 
Ah, that's what you want to call a soft blackmail, sure. Considering your last effort involved breaking in and flinging yourself out a window, I'd say your miracles all have a touch of darkness. Ah, ah, ah. You laugh and let, uh, let the old woman pull you into a tight hug. Sorja. Are the staff treating you well? Sorja releases you and takes a seat on her bed. Makes one sits beside her, taking her hand. They're over-eager, a tad condescending, but mostly harmless. I, I chase them out of my room whenever they get too annoying. So you haven't been mistreated? No, nothing like that. Uh, though there's no alcohol allowed in this place, not even the local fish they call beer. Uh, what about your legal guardian? How many times have you used, uh, have things been going? How have things been going there? Never seen or spoken to him. Though he's been scheduled to meet me a few times now. Nobody here thinks it's odd that he never shows. It's, uh, well, I've only ever talked about it with my, our orderly, Thomas, um, the useless bastard. What does Thomas say when you ask about your guardian? Something came up, I'm sure he'll be by next week. It's like, damn, Beckett play. You look at Aislinn lowering your voice. <clears throat> More fuel in our Oliver Reed doesn't an exist fire. Maybe Tomas is being paid to cover for him. He can explain himself on the witness stand. Your phone buzzes in tandem. You check the text. Gabe wants us back at the office. Damn, we've only been here a few minutes. And you'll come back tonight with the three cheese pizza and a six pack you smuggled in your purse. She laughs and wraps Orchana in another hug. I can do that. Sort you meet your eye over Aislinn's shoulder. Thank you for bringing her back to me. We'll have you out of here soon, Sorcha. I'll see about getting you cable and a keg. Forget cable. Get me a stack of books. Nothing intellectual. I, I want swooning women and rip gowns on the cover. Oh. Uh -huh. All the romance. Got it. Aislinn slips her hand into yours as you emerge from the subway. Do you have any idea what you did for me and my family? Technically, Sadie did it. But she wouldn't have bothered if it wasn't for you. How can I ever thank you for this, Quinn? It's true! I mean, I paid the money for it, literally and figuratively. Name a price, a favor, an impossible task. It's yours. <sighs> you, never, you never give a man this much power. Don't do it. I'll set her for <laughs> a firstborn. Weirdly enough, it'll be my firstborn. So anyway, uh, which technically is doable without even really asking for it. A kiss. I was thinking more, but you know, all right, fine. What you did deserves more than kisses, Quinn. Ah, uh, as much as I would like to take more, if I do it on the street, we'll both be very, very arrested. Hmm, then consider this a down payment. She tilts her chin and presses her lips to yours. You melt into her, winding an arm around her shoulder to hold her steady as people stream around you. After a long moment, she pulls away, but stays in your arms for a few more seconds, letting the bustle of New York flow by unheeded. I like this form of payment. Mm, good, because you have several more installments coming. Rrr. You arrive in Gabe's office to find Gigi already there. What's going on? Beats me, but he's been grinning. Uh-oh. For good reason. I may have a lead on a conservatorship case. What kind of lead? I've been making some calls about Carl Goodall and Erica Carpenter. It turns out they both came up under Calvin Colby. Calvin Colby? The mayoral candidate? You think he has something to do with this? I didn't say that. But I do think it's interesting detail. As in the fact that all three of them will be at Calvin's big fundraising event tomorrow. You were able to snag tickets this late? 
pre-order tickets leave a paper trail. I'm calling in favors. I don't want them to know we're coming until we're trapped on a yacht together. We're gate crashing a yacht party? That's right. They'll have nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. Which creates the ideal conditions for them to make a wrong move. Gabe's discovery is a big one. How is Calvin Colby connected to the conservatorship scheme? Keep playing to find out. Without further ado, thank you all for watching. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head down to the description of the video. There are plenty of cool links. There are ways to support. And without further ado, let me say the following. First of all, I'm sorry about this being late. I know. It's a, about a day late. I apologize. I have been just really feeling under the weather. Um, more so than usual. Trying to shake it off, right? Um, <clears throat> and just today, this has been a... A long morning, and then, uh, yeah, I, I got some sleep, finally. Um, and then the day prior, I just did not get any sleep whatsoever. And, the, you know, the fact that my cats were like, yo, let's split the curtain and have the sun shine right into his eyes while he's sleeping, you know, just... Ugh. Anyway, I do not like getting woke up by the sun, okay? It's something I hate. Um, <clears throat> with that being said... Um... I always like to raise awareness and give you guys a little bit of information and things like that, right? Um, I always like doing that, so let me say the following. Um, in terms of things like this going on, um, that's the thing. There are a number of current, and this is real life, by the way, there are a current uh, large amount of people who... Uh, not just in the U.S., but a lot of other countries who, who are not so good guys, not so good ladies either, um, that receive money from things that they should not be receiving from. Um, a lot of really bad things that they do, or hands they shake, or the whole nine yards, right? Um, that stuff happens all the time, unfortunately. So this implication that they're doing in this book... And again, it is actually something that is very, very real, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, it's a, a system that really um, needs to be looked into, a system that needs a lot of work, and uh, one that, uh, you know, you remember a little bit ago where people were in, a, in the U.S. were like, hey, we should really look into this, and, you know, we should follow the trail and all this. You remember what happened to those people? Those people shook the same hands, and they, they always act like, you know, they're out for your best interest, but at the end of the day, they're really not. And someone needs to just keep hammering on that and never give up on it. That's the thing is, and, and this will be one last thing I say, is, is people always like to do one thing, right? Um, for instance, uh, you know, supporting one cause, one uh, thing, and then once that cause gets its way, and eventually that does happen, um, people are like, hey, cool, and they become um, happy with what, they're do what they've done, they're like, yes, I did something worthwhile in my life, and I can now retire and never, you know, actually push for anybody else, and never do any good, and I just, yay, it's all over, fam, I don't need to do anything else for anybody else. That's not how life should be. That really, really isn't. Um, you should continue uh, speaking out for others because when you think that you are the only one going through that or you think your cause is the only one going through that, there are a lot of other people going through it as well. And uh, never stop, right? Um, you know, everyone should matter. And, um, you know, there should be... You should aim for a better environment better everything versus just betterness for one just group right just saying um again i always have to be a little bit of sugar coating and dance around the lingo because of uh the good old rules and youtube here so yeah if you ever want more of an honest opinion you can follow me on that purple thing um but yeah otherwise thanks for watching love your beautiful faces catch you all later peace out